Thank you. Justin. Welcome back from uh, lunch. <laughs> Hope you all enjoyed yourself and you're looking forward to um, what's going to be a packed session. Now, I've already been told that our speakers um, want to make use of all of the time, you. so your escape from here um, will be very prompt at the end. We're not going to have time for questions as we go through, so if you can bear with the speakers, they've got some fantastic stories I know they want to, to tell us. Um, I was very struck this morning that, that one of the themes that came out was this idea of having a story and being prepared to tell it. And that's what this afternoon session is about. It's about those leadership stories. It's about those people that we look to and go, do you know, if they can do that, then maybe I can do what I need to do. So we've got some fantastic things lined up for you just presently. I have one housekeeping thing which I've been asked to mention. Um, um, who's coming to dinner tonight? Show of hands. Good. Who's got their wallets? Damn. That motion wasn't carried, was it? Um, there's a charity uh, element to what we do uh, within you, Sizer, and there will be a charity uh, raffle this evening, so do bring your wallets. Do make sure it has um, money of the folding variety, I've been asked, um, to remind you, and we will have a huge amount of fun and uh, um, raise a lot of money for good causes, so thank you. Right, without further ado, let me introduce the first of uh, three really exciting uh, s speakers uh, who's going to come and talk to us about leadership. So, Alison Lowe, um, who is a former Labour councillor, I believe. Uh, not yet? <laughs> not yet? Not yet. See? Not there. And uh, CEO at a uh, uh, well-known charity, Touchdown. Alison, please take the stage. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me. So um, I've got to work out how to, how to do this because I, I haven't got an IT background, as you'll discover. Ah, there it is. Um, so my name's Alison Lowe. I'm the chief exec of a charity called Touchstone. And as you can tell from my accent, I'm from Leeds. And I, yes, Leeds is brilliant. Yorkshire is uh, just as good, nearly. Uh, so um, I've come today to talk to you about my leadership journey and hopefully uh, through uh, telling you about my life, some of you might think, oh, that has resonance with experiences uh, that I've had and maybe, hopefully, fingers crossed, it will give some people in the room permission to thrive, to grow, to be themselves, to love themselves, and to put two fingers up to those people or tell them they can't. Um, so that's, that's the tone of the, uh, the presentation. So I'll tell you a bit about Touchstone. Uh, so we're a mental health and wellbeing charity. We were born um, in 1982, a CPN and a, um, a social worker decided there weren't enough services in South Leeds for people on a weekend. They asked a local shopkeeper, can we use your shop for a Saturday and Sunday to have a little coffee morning for people and uh, however many years later we are now just over eight million pounds. Uh, we're all over West Yorkshire and into South Yorkshire too. Bain Mental Health is our USP. Um, 185 staff, we've actually got more than that because we've uh, just about to uh, recruit lots of staff for a whole new load of contracts, three million pounds worth of new contracts uh, next week are starting so we'll have about another 50 people joining us. 48% uh, of our staff were BME, who knows after next week, and 59% of our service users are also BME, black minority ethnic, for those of you who don't know what that means. Um, and 14 of our services uh, specifically to serve the needs of BME communities with mental health uh, difficulties across the regions that we work in. So I'm going to tell you about my leadership journey and um, I could tell you all about going to university because there's a lot of people here from universities, etc., with my two children, and uh, but I won't. Maybe that'll come out in the uh, in the afternoon session. So I'm going to start from 2004, 39. I know I still look 39, but unfortunately I'm not. Um, I was appointed as chief exec at Touchstone. Um, I come from a, a, a stay in in Seacroft, so it was a really big day for me uh, when I was appointed chief exec. Uh, and the thing about Touchstone was it was in a really bad space when I got there. Lots and lots of um, problems, uh, no money. We were not able to set a budget in the first year. We did set a budget, but uh, we didn't have a budget that actually balanced in the first year. Really bad management. 
trustees hadn't really done the job. Uh, we were being sued left, right and centre. People had died in our properties. It was horrendous. So that was good for me because I could only shine under the circumstances. There was only one way to go and that was up. So if you're going to get a new job, go somewhere that's rubbish because then you can turn it into something good. And that, that was my experience. But also, because it was so bad and I could only shine, it meant that really I got a bit cocky. I thought I was a bit fantastic. Uh, of course, I am fantastic, but not quite as fantastic as I thought I was. Uh, so having gone into Touchstone and turned it around and saved everybody on my white charger and shown everybody how fantastic I was, um, I, I then had to prepare for the new uh, uh, world, which was a, a potential change in government and huge cuts to the voluntary sector, which we knew were going to come from about 2010. So in 2009, being a planner, that's what I am, I like to have lots of planners in place, I decided let's do some uh, reviews of all our staff pay terms and conditions, let's be forward thinking, sort all the cuts out before they actually happen, um, it'll be fine because everybody loves me because I'm Alison Lone, I'm brilliant and I'm fantastic and I've saved everybody from the gutter, they think I'm great. Well I was wrong, uh, they didn't think I was great, they thought I was rubbish. And um, really, looking back, there was quite a lot of stuff that I did that um, wasn't that good. And I think that um, a lot of that was about what I thought leadership should be and what I now know leadership is. So I hadn't really properly communicated with staff about what we were doing and why we were doing it. I'd allowed huge um, uh, gaping holes in the communication process because I thought, oh, you've got to give them time to grieve the fact that things are changing, it's all okay. It wasn't okay. But I think underpinning all that was the feeling that I was brilliant. It didn't matter what I did, everybody would think I was fantastic. So just go through there, do what you needed to do, steam through all your decisions and it'd all be fine. So this is my staff stood outside Touchstone House on the front page of the Unison newspaper and they're on strike. It wasn't very good because I am a Labour councillor for 29 years until May the 2nd when I stand down. Uh, but then I was in the, the middle of my uh, um, time as a, a Labour councillor and this was me in Leeds getting a lot of asyl from Unison on the front page of the Unison newspaper. I was getting shouted at by the leader of the council. It wasn't a good space to be in. I was under a lot of pressure. And I had to then reflect how had I got here? How had all that brilliant star ended up? in this place with my staff stood outside with massive placard saying no to low pay, that's L-O-W-E. And uh, it didn't look good. And people beeping the door on outside to say, yeah, we support you. And then really, it led me to a space where I recognised that I'd got us into where we'd uh, got to. It wasn't about it's all staff's fault. Why don't they understand the bigger picture? They should be more strategic. If they understood that the cuts were coming, then they won't be blaming me. Well, of course we're going to blame me because change management is a thing that all leaders will discover um, is an art, not a science. Um, and actually, there's a lot of feelings. But as a leader, you've got to get in there and you've got to really understand the pain that you're inflicting and uh, allow your staff time and space with you to explore some of those things. But I think part of the reason why I hadn't put myself in that vulnerable position was because once I'd allowed myself to be vulnerable, I didn't know what else could come out. So underpinning me as a leader was Alison also, who was a victim. So when I was five years old, I was sexually abused by the next door neighbour. I never told anyone until I was 45. I'm 54 now. So it wasn't a long time ago, but it took me a long, long time to tell anybody. Um, and also... Uh, as a result of the abuse I experienced as a child, I went on to have abusive relationships. So I married somebody who was incredibly violent uh, for 10 years. Um, and I, I realise now that I created these, pa these patterns of victimisation. I victimised myself. I didn't do anything to stop that. Um, but when I became a chief exec, <clears throat> what happened is... Um, I had power in that position and I didn't have power when I was a child and so I misused that power as an adult and sometimes on my dark days I recognise that I abused that power when I was a bully. I don't like to say that, that's not who I want to be. I'm not that person anymore, hopefully my staff will tell you that but I think there were times when I was a bully and that was because 
I was misusing my power in the way that power had been misused against me. So I think the first lesson in leadership that I'm going to talk to you about today is authenticity. You'll hear this word, everyone says leaders have got to be authentic. But in order to be authentic, you've got to truly know yourself. You've got to understand the journey that you've been on, understand that stuff that's happened to you in your life has an impact. It, that might be psychological, it might be something like PTSD, it might be any number of things. But if you don't acknowledge that the stuff that happens to you in your life uh, is impacting on you and making you behave in, in certain ways or making you retreat to a place that is defensive or is angry or is not a leader, then you're not going to be a leader because stuff happens to us all the time and it has an impact. And being an authentic leader means that you can talk about that stuff openly. So at Touchstone, I tell all my staff what I've just told you. I also tell them that um, I'm not perfect. And having been through that journey, I really am proud of the fact that I'm not perfect. I'm very happy that I'm not perfect because that doesn't put pressure on me to be perfect. Um, and we have a really open culture at Touchstone where we talk about mistakes, we talk about our mental health. I have depression, I experience anxiety and panic attacks as a result of the trauma that I experienced as a child, but also the trauma that I experienced as an adult. Um, and I think it's important to talk about the stuff that we uh, go through uh, as adults and tell our staff that we're human, we're like them, and it's okay not to be okay every day. It's also incredibly important to have integrity because um, once it's gone, it's gone forever. You know, if you're saying to your staff, trust me, believe me, then everything you do has got to honour that value. So I, I always say to staff that, you know, when you get asked to do stuff and you're not really comfortable and you get that awful, funny, sinking feeling at the pit of your stomach, well, that's your conscience telling you this is not wrong, that this is wrong and it's not in line with your values, so don't do it. That's what it's telling you. And I say to all my staff, if you ever get that feeling when we ask you to do something, then one of two things has happened. One, we haven't explained it properly because we're all really, really fast. We're running around, we're busy, we want people to get stuff done and we think you're going to do it by symbiosis sometimes. We don't communicate effectively. So sometimes people can think, did they really ask me to kill that dog? Of course, we didn't ask them to kill that dog. But, you know, things get lost in translation. So let's have a conversation. Feel brave, come and tell us, let's have a conversation and we can reframe it. But actually, sometimes, because we're unhuman, because we make mistakes, because we're not perfect, that thing might be wrong. We might be making the wrong decision. So integrity means you being brave and saying to us, please have a think about this again. I think you're wrong. We've got this list of values, live quirk, because we like to live our lives and be quirky at Touchstone. Um, it's not in line with our values. So have a think again about what you've done. And... Uh, I'm really, really proud when our staff ask us to think again and are really brave and stop us doing things that might take us uh, down the wrong path because actually they're then investing in the success of the organisation. They're owning the success of the organisation and what they're saying is they're leaders because we're all leaders and if you don't build the capacity for all your staff to be part of the leadership journey, then you're not a leader and you will fail. Um, so we also understand that everyone's different. So downstairs, I was really amused because there were lots and lots of men on their own at tables with the little laptops or the phones with the, their earphones in. And then all the women were talking in little groups together. Um, a bit of a generalisation, there were some mixed groups going on. But generally, it was, uh, it was quite amusing. And that's because we're all different. So we use things like Myers-Briggs at Touchstone. You don't have to use Myers-Briggs. There's lots of different tools. Uh, but... That tells us who's an introvert, who likes to be on their own at lunchtime on their uh, tablet, and who's an extrovert, who likes to be with other people, chatting away, having a laugh. That's me, obviously. Um, and what we do is we understand what each preference uh, each person has and what they can bring. So we often talk about people being F and people being T. So I'm a massive T, which is I make decisions with my head, and F, uh, people make decisions with the heart. Both are valid, both are important, and we'll often have a senior management team, for example, where we'll be making a decision, and I'll say, right, we've had a lot of my voice, we've had a lot of T. Let's have a bit of F, come on F, contribute, tell us. Uh, we don't want another strike, so 
where are the flaws, where is the people stuff here that we need to incorporate. So we get this right, we have both sides, both halves of the whole, so we get this uh, as right as we possibly can. Not that it'll always be popular, but as, as long as we've got integrity, we've communicated effectively, and we've understood the different needs of each member of staff um, in how they receive that information and keep on receiving that information, we won't go far wrong. So leadership is putting yourself out there, even when you're an introvert. So this is me on the stage at the uh, Millennium Square during Pride. It's three pictures. I'm not in three places at once. Um, and I'm looking stupid wearing angel wings. And what I'm saying to the 30 or 40,000 people in front of me is, Leeds is an inclusive city. This is my councillor role, obviously. Leeds is an inclusive city. And I don't mind looking like an idiot if you think that Leeds is an inclusive city and you can come to us if you're LGB or T and you feel that um, your difference needs to be included in the way that the, the civic hall, the council runs its, uh, its services. And I say to people, give me a ring if you think that we can do better, if you've got a problem. I don't like bullies. I, I know what a bully is. I don't like it. Give me a ring. Um, and I don't mind doing that because I want people to see that I'm prepared to look stupid in order for people to see how passionate I am about inclusion and about fairness and about justice. Another thing that we do at Touchstone is we identify where um, the culture, the uh, times that we're in are impacting negatively on group A or group B. And at the moment, as a mental health organisation, we're identifying huge issues with Islamophobia. We, we all saw what happened in Christchurch. Islamophobia is real. It's making a massive difference, a negative impact on people's lives. One in six of all our staff is Muslim. One in six of all our service users are Muslim. We have a duty to find out about what Islam is, what Islam isn't, understand the impact of Islamophobia on the mental health of the people that we work with and for. So we do huge training um, sessions for all our staff. We co-produce the training with MEND, which is a, a specialist organisation, um, and it's a mandatory training. Everybody has to go on that. We're now repeating all that with Translead. So we're working uh, with uh, another organisation called Transleads so that we understand what um, being trans uh, is, what we, underst we understand non-binary, we understand all these different things that may be new and we, don't, we didn't understand before because people who are trans and non-binary, their mental health is so bad. So we have a duty as leaders to think about who's next, what's the big group of people who are really going to need us next. So we get that information, we learn, and then we're able to respond. Uh, so I'm going to wind down now by talking in general terms about what leadership is. For me, it's about creating safe places where everyone can work together. So telling people about my abuse, telling people about my mental health, telling people um, who are different to me that they're welcome, that they're safe at Touchstone, and creating that culture where people feel safe is, I think, the uh, touchstone of a leader. If people don't feel safe, they, they can't thrive. They can't be the best that they can be. They won't trust you if you don't, uh, if you don't uh, do as you say that you're doing. So everything about working for my organisation is about being safe. Because I feel safe there, and if I feel safe there, everybody feels safe there. But it's also about having a laugh. You've got to have fun. If you don't laugh at work, obviously not every day, but if you don't have times when you make space for fun, for laughter, for joy, then um, you're not really going to um, get the best out of your staff. Uh, and when you're working in a really um, fraught, difficult, uh, stressful environment, as I know you are in uh, your environments, and we work in mental health, so we're hearing terrible stories, people are really ill, people are getting sectioned, it's really important that our staff get rewarded and that they're um, allowed to have downtime. That's really important. But, you know, let's just be honest. Downtime is not about banter. Downtime is not about talking about other people and making spaces unsafe. We don't have banter at Touchstone, ever. We don't laugh at anybody else. We don't have page three girls on the wall. I know that that doesn't happen anymore, but it does in some places. I know that um, people still say it's okay to have a laugh at that person because it's called banter. No. That's not what leaders do, so please, don't allow banter in the workplace. It's an excuse for bigotry, racism, bullying. And it works. So we do all this stuff, and these are the rewards. We're investors in people platinum. Um, we are 
the number one most inclusive UK employer for the third year running. We beat Bloomberg and Sky and um, all these other uh, big players who are global and we're just West Yorkshire, we're just a uh, 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 little touchstone. We're the National Diversity Award winners last November and we're also uh, for the um, sixth year running Stonewall Top 100 employers. Uh, we've just been named uh, as a three star extraordinary Sunday Times best company to work for, number eighth. Uh, and we've won two other awards from the Sunday Times in February. So we win lots and lots of awards. And what's great is that most of these awards require staff to feedback. So all our engagement, all our inclusion of staff leads to them saying really good things about our organisation. People don't leave Touchstone. Sometimes that's a problem, but people don't leave Touchstone. And um, I get um, staff telling me when we do our induction meetings that they've tried two, three, four, five times to get into Touchstone. That's how desperate people are to work for me and work for the organisation that makes them feel that they can be who they truly need to be. So my top three tips, be a leader in its global sense. And that means encouraging everyone in your organisation to take personal responsibility, encourage them to make their own choices, be autonomous, be a leader, create a culture where it's possible for people to all be a leader. Be human. Tell your stories, but do it in a safe space. I told you I didn't tell anyone about my abuse for 40 years. Um, I didn't feel able to, and now I tell everybody. So um, it's fine for me, I'm 54, but it may not be fine for you. So do it in a safe space, do it in a way that keeps you safe. Um, but once you start to tell your story, amazingly, it makes you well. So I have mental health difficulties, but the more I tell my story, the, 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 the spaces between my depression get bigger and bigger and bigger. So I do this because it helps me too, and hopefully it'll help you. Be brave. Sometimes putting your hand up and saying that's wrong, putting your hand up and saying, no, I'm not going to sign up to this. I'm not agreeing to this. When things are not right, when you hear things that you know you've got to challenge, that's hard. But that's what leaders do. Leaders put themselves out there all the time. So demonstrate your leadership. Tell your stories. Be proud that you're not perfect, because none of us are. Know that you can, I did, and so can you. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Alison, for uh, sharing. Um, you said there were going to be some great stories. Uh, that there will be. Uh, next up is uh, somebody who, actually, a lot of people in this, this room will, will feel they know very well. Uh, Sally, Sally Bogg is... Um, Head of Service Management at Leeds Beckett University. Um, but she's had an interesting journey. Um, she's won multiple awards and she thoroughly deserves them. She's a great pleasure to work with. But I think we're about to find some things about Sally that we may not have known that should be an inspiration to all of us about how you can overcome those bumps in life and how you can be successful. So Sally, thank you. a tough one to follow but okay um, so my session today is leadership lessons from real life and why a degree is so much more than a degree <clears throat> so a bit about me um, I'm a shoe loving tea drinking Yorkshire lass I have an absolute passion for IT for customer service and for higher education I work at IT services at Leeds Beckett University I'm head of service management um, and that means I've got responsible responsibility for our ITSM tool set, rolling out service management across the department, the strategy for that. <clears throat> and I also look after service desk, desktop, desk side support, um, comms and training. Um, and I'm going to share with you my quite personal journey um, and hopefully some um, life lessons that maybe will give you some top tips for your leadership. Um, but to do that, I've got to go right back to the beginning. Um, so my life did not get off to a particularly good start. Um, I had a really troubled, difficult childhood. Um, my parents divorced when I was four, and by the time I was 15, I had moved home, I think well over a dozen times, and my mum was on a fourth husband. Um, so no surprise then when I turned into a bit of a wild child. Um, and by the age of 16, I was living in a hostel for um, sort of young homeless people. Now, I'd always been academically um, quite gifted. I'd spent a lot of my childhood buried in books. That was my escape route. Um, 
And I was in the sixth form, I had some really supportive teachers, um, but I also had to work because I had to self-fund. Um, and although I was trying to stay on the straight and narrow, um, I started to make some really, really bad choices. Um, a few months after uh, kind of moving into the hostel, I found out I was pregnant. Now, this was the early 90s, um, and there was practically no support for teenage mums um, within education in those days. And I went to a church school, so um, I, I like to put it politely to say I was asked to leave. I was, I was actually kicked out. Um, and to be honest, um, I thought that was the it uh, in terms of education. Um, and, and it didn't feel like a loss, really, because I'd never really believed that girls like me um, went to university. I'd not been raised to have any uh, aspirations. None, none of my family had careers. They had jobs, and jobs paid the bill, uh, bills, but, but didn't really have the aspirations. Um, so for the next few years, I really focused on taking care of my little girl, um, and that meant um, having to work. I've had some really awful jobs. Um, I've worked in a carrot factory, packing carrots. Um, I've worked on a pie and pea stall in Leeds Market. Um, and my, perhaps my favourite one, um, least favourite one, uh, was at the age of 18, I was working in, as a barmaid in a working men's club um, at a time when women couldn't buy drinks at the bar. Um, so you can imagine what that was like. Um, so that photograph there on the end, um, although I'm smiling on that picture, um, I'm 21 at that point, I was actually in a really, really um, bad place. Um, I was feeling pretty washed up and broken. I had grown up surrounded by um, alcohol abuse, by domestic abuse, violence, um, alcohol issues. Um, and I was also in the middle of a really, really traumatic um, breakup of a very toxic and abusive relationship. Um, but I knew no matter what, I had to kind of keep going. Um, so, I, you know, I had this little girl that I was responsible for, and I knew that no matter what, no matter how bad things were, she needed to have a better life than I'd had. Um, so it wasn't all doom and gloom then. Things started to kind of look up. I met and married my husband in 1997, um, and at the age of 25, I had two more children and was a full-time stay-at-home mum. However, following a bout of quite severe postnatal depression and the death of my dad, I realised that I needed change in my life and I finally came to the conclusion that I needed to be the one to make the change. I didn't really enjoy being a full-time stay-at-home mum. I was bored and I was frustrated and we had no money. Um, but my previous kind of work experience and lack of qualifications didn't really give me many options. Um, and the job market was kind of off the cards because I couldn't afford childcare anyway. Um, now, at this point, I was hearing about this thing called the internet. I had no idea what it was. I couldn't even turn a computer on. Um, you had to be in the top math set at school when I was at school to do IT. Um, and I certainly wasn't in the top math set. So, um, so I was quite curious um, about um, finding out more about technology. So with a lot of encouragement and support from my husband, I enrolled on a part-time uh, course at the local university. Um, and that saved my life in a way. It um, gave me an interest. I really got the bug um, and it gave me a purpose. Um, and so I followed this by doing an access to computing um, course and resat my English maths and GCSE at the same time. Um, I would just like to say at that point I was um, funded, so there was a really good program within the local college, uh, ironically funded by the European Union, and it was all about getting women into technology. Um, and yeah, it was, it was good, and I'd, I'd kind of found my way again. So in 2001, I got uh, the opportunity to go to university, and I enrolled as an undergraduate at Leeds Met Uni, as we were called then, for very, very long years of kind of juggling studying with family life um, and it was really difficult um, in my cohort we were two there was 200 in my cohort and I think there was less than a dozen were women um, and certainly none had three young children it had group work quite interesting there was no all-nighters for me anyway um, and I struggled and I came close to quitting quite a few times I actually had to resit my second year um, which was you know frustrating and, and disappointing um, but I did it um, and in 2006 I graduated with a degree in computing I was the first person in my family to get a university education and graduation day will stay with me uh, for the rest of my life um, so that was it I'd got the degree right a job um, so being surrounded by men throughout my course left me feeling that like maybe 
the tech sector wasn't the place for a 32-year-old mum of three. Um, so after graduation, I'd set my sight on working in education, preferably higher education. I applied for just about any job going, um, but really struggled because I didn't have any work experience. Um, but I kept going, I kept applying, uh, 40 applications and several in dreadful interviews later, um, I was finally offered the role of admin assistant. So not quite what I'd hoped for when I got finished uni, um, this was about three months after, but I was in the right place, so although it was an admin role, I was actually working in the IT department. I couldn't believe it, a proper job. When they said things like sick pay and maternity pay and, and holidays, and it was just absolutely unreal. <coughs> I felt like I'd won the lottery. Um, so I spent the next 18 months working as an admin assistant in, the all -male, in an all-male team. Um, really loved the job, had a fantastic manager. Um, and that's the difference a fantastic manager can make because he could see my potential and he let me just try anything that was kind of going, really. Um, and that meant I got to take on some additional roles and responsibilities and I got to get involved with service level management. Um, now, ITIL was quite a new thing for the university at that point um, and they just started to advertise some ITIL roles. Um, um, now, starting a career at 32, although it's been quite challenging, it's been really good because that has been my rocket fuel because I always feel like I've got to catch up. <laughs> So I'm um, very driven um, and knew I kind of wanted to, to get on. So I saw this job advertised for incident manager. Now, it was, I was grade five and this was a grade seven and everybody said, oh, you can't go from a five to a seven. I thought, well, why can't you? Um, so I looked through the job spec um, and I knew I didn't have the exact experience, but this was a new role and I knew nobody in the department had the exact experience. Um, and I knew I could do it, so I put in the application um, and was really pleased when, when I kind of got the job. Um, and then I really started to find the bit of IT that I liked, which was service management, not so much the ITIL process stuff, but actually service management is really about people. Um, I um, really got to kind of expand my network within the department. Previously, I've been quite insular in my team. Um, and I loved the role. I got more involved with stuff. And I learned about how IT services are actually delivered. Um, and I gained loads of experience um, and started to kind of really build my career. But I knew if I wanted to progress to the next level, that I would need some kind of management um, experience. Um, again, I saw an opportunity. Service desk manager was going on maternity. They needed somebody to temporarily fill the role. Um, again, it, it wasn't necessarily a promotion in terms of grade, but I thought it would give me the experience I needed. Um, so I applied and I got it. And actually, that maternity cover was extended to five years. Um, I spent five years as service desk manager. I got to build the most amazing team. I was involved in some really innovative projects and initiatives. Um, we were the second UK university to get service desk certification just pipped to the post by St Andrews, but I'm not bitter. Um, we brought in a laptop repair service. We relocated the service desk into newly designed office space. Won a few awards along the way. Things were going really well. Um, and then I got to do a bit of work with some external colleagues from Leeds Beckett University. And they mentioned they had a couple of jobs going. Now, my immediate response was, no, thank you. I'm really happy at Leeds. Um, and then I went home that night and I thought, I've been saying that for so long. Is it actually true? Um, and it wasn't. I was getting bored and I had a really good manager that would always find me something dead exciting, but it was usually outside of my day job. And I realised I was stuck. Um, there was no career progression on the horizon at that point. Um, and although in my heart I'd always felt I would play out my career at Leeds Uni, I realised at that point that if I wanted the progression, I was going to have to leave. Um, it was a huge wrench. Uh, I remember finishing on my last day. Um, I cried all day, much to the embarrassment and mortification of my team. Um, and I left that day thinking, this is it. I will, wherever I go and whatever I do, I will never get this feeling with this team again. Um, but I now know, of course, that that isn't true. Um, and I work with many more amazing colleagues at Leeds Beckett University um, and have worked with e equally brilliant teams. And I'll just give a shout out to our service desk analyst, Adam, who won uh, Best Analyst at the SCI Awards um, on Wednesday. Um, but this was actually a reminder to me of that importance of self-reflection and to just slow down and actually do take the moment to think about it and also not to let fear hold me back. Um, I joined Leeds Beckett University on the 1st of December 2015 
Um, and it was actually a really surreal experience. Um, so if any of you know the campus, um, there's a beautiful old manor house called The Grange, and that's where the home of I, that's where IT services are. But weirdly, it was where I'd spent all of my time as an undergraduate. So our big main meeting room was where all the IT labs. So I rocked up on that first day, and I thought, actually, this is it. I've come full circle. Um, I'm so proud to be working at the university that gave me my first step on the ladder. Um, and, and actually, universities like Leeds Beckett play a really, really important role um, in maybe giving people like me that second chance. Um, Again, I've been involved in some brilliant, brilliant initiatives. And in fact, I love this university so much. Um, we chose it as a wedding venue when my daughter got married last summer. Um, so just then a little bit about impact. And, and that was why the, the subject of this presentation is why a degree is not just about a degree. University wasn't just life changing for me. It was life changing for my family. Um, my passion and my love for HE, I think, has kind of caught on. Um, <clears throat> Despite leaving school, he'll kill me for saying this, despite leaving school in 1986 with not a single qualification, my husband has since gone on to complete um, a part-time BA in education, Huddersfield University Al, um, and now works in the education sector. University education has enabled us to drastically improve our career prospects and our job prospects and also our outlook on life. We've been able to, we were able to buy a house when the kids were young. We got to move off this really kind of quite rough in a city council estate um, into a village. Um, and it meant that my kids had the kind of childhood that I'd only dreamed of. Then uh, Hot Summer's Day 2014, I watched my eldest graduate uh, from York University with um, a degree in law. Um, uh, it was just a beautiful, beautiful day. And then, um, so my middle daughter, Eloise, was there that day as well. And at that point, she was kind of, she'd struggled with academia. She wasn't a natural academic in the way Holly had been. Um, she didn't really like school. Uh, she didn't know what she wanted to do. But she was there on graduation day. Um, and she quite likes a bit of fuss and attention. Um, and she kind of saw what was, what was there. And it lit an absolute fire in her. Um, and despite having to overcome many challenges, she was able to complete a foundation degree um, through Teesside University. And she graduated in November 2018. Um, and my youngest has just started his first year at Leeds Arts University. But more about him in a minute. So that's my kind of um, career journey. And I think it's just important to be reminded of what we do. Um, I, th I was talking to Jim earlier and he was saying about how we think of universities as businesses, but actually they're not businesses. These are the things that we do. We transform lives and I don't care whether you work in estates, IT, whether you know you clean the toilets, we are all part of that and we are transforming lives. Um, so things I've learned along the way, I've got top, top three tips to share with you. Um, first of all, networking is a two-way process. So as I mentioned yesterday, um, I attended this conference in 2014 when I was service desk manager. Um, and although I really loved the sessions and I really loved the speakers, I did not have the best experience. Um, I'd previously been to a couple of conferences, mainly the support services, but nothing on this size or scale. Um, now at this point, I knew that I had to start thinking about developing my professional network beyond service desk. <laughs> I needed some new contacts um, and I wanted to get in more, uh, involved in more strategic discussions and conversations. And ultimately, I was looking to kind of raise my profile within the sector. <coughs> so although I was kind of looking forward to the event, I was also quite nervous. The thought of networking outside my own kind of territory, my own stamping ground was, was really scary. Um, and it did not go well. Uh, I arrived and I immediately felt really wrong footed. Um, surrounded by lots of men in suits who all seem to know each other and they all seem really posh to me um, and um, I just I just was back to being that kid on that council estate I'm sometimes really aware of my accent um, and I've come to embrace it I've come to love it but I, I, there's been times when I've been really conscious of it um, and I just felt like people weren't really that interested in talking to a service desk manager. Um, I felt out of place and out of my depth, and I spent much of my time hiding in the toilets or in my hotel room. Um, so where did it go wrong then? I think I will take ownership of this and say I did not go in with the right approach. Um, I think I should have had a much more positive outlook and thinking about networking as what I could offer to the conversation. Um, as much as what I wanted to get out of it, I think I'd have felt more confident. Um, 
And actually, what I've learned is the thing that makes me different, whether that's my accent or my story, is the value that I can bring to the conversation because I bring a different perspective. Um, and whether that is being from a working class background, whether that's from being a mature student, uh, whether it's from being from Yorkshire, um, whatever. Um, but th that is my value. Um, and I'm sure if I'd have gone in with that approach, I'd have got more from the experience. And imagine if everybody goes into networking with that approach. Um, if everybody went in thinking what could they offer to the conversation or how could they potentially support others. So my top tip then is to approach networking as an opportunity to help and support others. Instead of going around with the blinkers on, you know, what can you do for me? Where are the contacts I can make? And actually focusing on what you can give rather than what you can get. If we all did that at these events, imagine that we would make much richer, more supportive and ultimately much more powerful networks. And you never know, you might end up rescuing somebody from hiding away in the toilets. Um, so that's top tip number one. Top tip number two is about staying teachable. Um, so this is my youngest son, Sam, um, enrolled as an undergraduate at Leeds Arts, uh, quite an introverted child, but was never afraid to march to the beat of his own drum. Um, he's grown into a quiet but very sensitive young man. <coughs> And it wasn't a huge surprise at 15 when he told us that he was gay. Um, it just wasn't an issue. It was the most undramatic coming out story ever, much to the disappointment of my middle child who likes much more drama. Um, uh, and, you know, it, just wasn't, it was just an, a non-issue. A non um, I considered myself to be really kind of liberal and accepting and socially aware. Um, just wasn't a big deal. What I wasn't prepared for, however, was the announcement three years later that um, he was going to be a drag queen. Um, um, and it certainly throws a curveball, but ultimately he's just Sam, and I, you know, that doesn't change. We love him as he is. What's been interesting for me, though, is watching him kind of navigate his route. Um, and that has, I've learned just so much from watching him there. Um, I've learned that the world is not as accepting a place as I thought it was. Um, and that for many of the LGBT community, the world is a difficult and challenging place. Um, I've learned about loads about the nuances. So uh, we have conversations about the difference between transsexual, transgender, pansexual, toxic masculinity. That's his favourite one at the moment. Um, I just have these amazing conversations with him and I'm just learning so much. And I realised through those conversations just how many misconceptions and unconscious biases I had and how much I was closed off to learning. And I was closed off to it because I thought I knew there was, I thought I knew everything there was to know. Um, and I don't, I know nothing really. And so it was just a wake up call for me to, um, to just remind how important as a leader it is to be open to other people's ideas and experiences. So that's top tip number two. It's about staying teachable. And then finally, um, this is the one that I have struggled with the most, um, and it's something, though, that has enabled me to grow the most and has really uh, contributed to my growth as a leader. At the start of my career, um, all the leaders I saw around me um, were people with all the answers, um, and I thought to be an effective leader, one, it came with a job title, uh, and two, you needed to be strong, you needed to be resilient, um, you needed to be authoritative, um, and you needed to know everything. Um, and that's what I saw around me, leaders that were ambitious, they were driven, they were strong, they were all male, um, they spoke with authority, they had the answers. But often I found them kind of a bit devoid of passion or emotion, and I actually struggled to be motiva motivated by them. Um, now, for many years, I felt um, quite defined by the things that happened to me, and so I worked really hard to hide that because I didn't want to show my vulnerability. I didn't want to be defined by my childhood and where I'd come from. Um, and in the early years of my career, um, I kind of hid a lot of who I was. So first year um, new into a career at 32, I got a job as a secretary. I thought, oh, this is what secretaries do and this is how they behaved. Um, so I played up to that role of a blonde ditzy secretary and I quickly realised that was going to get me nowhere. Um, so then I started to emulate what was around me, which was this very authoritative, very um, strong leadership. Uh, but that didn't work either. One, because I was doing that, I was playing a role. But the other is, um, guess what IT doesn't need? It doesn't need more men in you know, being strong and authoritative. Um, and that's it. I've learned that it's my, my value is in my different perspective. Um, but actually, if I'm going to bring my authentic self to my leadership, 
it meant that I had to open up about who I was and where I was coming from. Um, and actually, by sharing my story, I could take back the control of that. Um, so no longer am I defined by the things that happen to me, that I'm in control of that. Um, and actually, by showing my vulnerability, um, I've, kind of, um, I've kind of rid myself of my demons, basically. Um, that's not to say it's not, it's, you know, it's difficult, it's not um, a straightforward thing to do. Um, but I've had nothing but a positive response from it. So um, every time I get that positive feedback, it just kind of um, reinforces it. So that would be my top tips. And I want you to think about vulnerability um, and think back to the last time you actually felt vulnerable. And I think actually, if you think about it, we are at our most vulnerable when we're doing things that take us out of our comfort zone. Starting a new job, owning up to a mistake, putting your hand up to take on something new, um, opening up about something. And then you realise that actually vulnerability is not a weakness. Vulnerability is a strength. It takes authenticity and it takes courage. And surely they are the things that we want to see in leadership. So that's what I've done um, and it works really well for me. Um, but I also think it, it, the benefits of showing my vulnerability as a leader go beyond my own personal growth. Um, as a leader, if I'm able to talk about my issues, my challenges and my struggles, it enables others around me to do the same and allowing people to talk about their stuff and their issues allows them to take back control. So this today is me showing my vulnerability. Um, I read somewhere that vulnerability was kind of sum uh, sum summarised as having the courage to show up and be seen and I think um, that kind of sums it up for me. So that's the end of my session. I hope you found it interesting. hope you found it useful. That's quite important to me. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Peter. So thank you very much. <clears throat> wow, thank you. Um, lots to reflect on there. Um, a very personal story that I'm sure will, will chime with, with lots of us, lots of people in the room, people we know, people we work with. Everybody has a story. And I think it's really important that we do learn to share our stories and to listen to other people's stories because they're important too. So thank you for, for sharing, Sally. Right, our final speaker, uh, you've seen earlier today, uh, Natasha Saisa-Zaleen, Head of Technology at Sky. Um, I'm just mildly... Um, interested in how Natasha's going to tell us about the four careers she's had because I'm sure that won't have been an easy journey either so Natasha can I invite you to take the stage please thank you hi everyone um is it possible to get 30 minutes on the clock is that possible it's just I'm such an over talker it's all right I'll, I'll rock it I've got to work so, hi everyone. Um, my name is Natasha Saisalem. I'm one of the heads of technology at Sky, and I'm really grateful to Sally for inviting me along to this. I've had a really great day today. Um, so, I'm going to start since this film is 20 years old this year. Does anybody know what this film is? Somebody shout it out if you know. Oh, come on. <laughs> Office Space. If you haven't seen it, it is brilliant. Um, so, hands up in the room. Hands up if you have left a job due to a bad manager. Come on, be honest. I think some of you are being a bit shy, but that's good. Uh, or maybe your boss is in here. <laughs> um, how many of you have heard that soft skills are a nice to have? Yeah? So I'm coming to talk to you about some of my lessons in leadership. And one of the first ones that I'm going to talk to you about, and I talked about it earlier this morning, was about this perception of soft skills being fluffy, um, hence the background. So hard skills, we know what hard skills are. They're tangible skills, they can be taught. Things like maps, they are tangible skills. Coding is a hard skill. Now soft skills, they sound fluffy, don't they? They sound easy, nice to have, insignificant. And I'm here to say that I disagree with that fundamentally. And I want to go as far as to say I want to ban that word. Because if I'm being honest, I think actually they are the hard skills. They are the skills that take an eternity to learn. Um, Professor Sophie Scott said um, 
it takes you till about 20 years of age to work out the difference between a genuine laugh and a social laugh. A genuine gut-wrenching laugh, natural laugh, and something that you do in social commentary. It takes you 20 years old to be fluent in recognising it. And that's the thing with human skills or soft skills, is that we take an eternity to learn them, and they become like a toolkit. And that every time we're in a new situation, when we're speaking to somebody different, somebody new, um, you have to go to that toolkit and learn new ways um, to interact. And that's why I don't think it's the right word, because actually the word is, they are human skills. They're not soft. They are human skills that we need day to day, or to call them what they really are, they're critical business skills. We cannot cope without these skills. So let's look at these pesky soft skills. What are these soft skills? Well, let's have a look. We've got things like attitude, social skills, creative thinking, motivation, communication, empathy, emotional intelligence, problem solving, teamwork, decision making, collaboration. These nice to have? These easy? I tell you, problem solving isn't easy, and these take time to learn. For those who work in tech, the best thing about problem solving is working in the industry and experiencing problems, and then as a team, you've learned how to solve them. So the next time that problem comes along, you can go, actually, you know, have we checked the server? Have we checked um, the data centers? You only know that to, to do that because you've been in that problem before and you've learned those techniques. <coughs> these aren't easy things to learn but they are fundamental to industry. And so to call them soft, to call them a nice to have, it's an absolute misnomer. So, if you, you know, not to go all political, but you know, thinking about Brexit, things like flexibility, see what I did there? Um, <laughs> flexibility, um, communication, empathy for different sides of an argument, Negotiation isn't always about winning. Negotiation, a good negotiation, is about both sides coming away with a happy resolution. So I want to talk about a few of them which are really important to me. So a big one for me is empathy, empathy and technology. A culture of empathy starts with all of us, and that comes from the bottom down, from, from sorry, the top down at a leadership level. Our technology solutions are only as empathetic as we are. So that video, I'll just go back, and, oh, see if that works. That is um, a gentleman with dark skin who uh, the soap dispenser won't work because the sensor doesn't pick up his skin tone. And if you speak to people from a BAMU background, they say this is incredibly common. 60-70% um, of uh, the time female voices aren't picked up on Alexa or TomTom's actually apparently the worst. Um, so my friends, my female friends say to get their tom-tom to work, they have to speak in a gruff voice. Like, hello, can I go to... No, I can't do it. Um, but we filter our understanding through our biases, which is, as the lady said earlier, both conscious and unconscious. Truly understanding the other perspective needs deep listening and observing. And the thing is with empathy... It's not about being, in somebody, you know, being yourself in somebody else's shoes. I think that's a really dangerous statement to make. It's being them in their shoes. And that's, it's a subtle difference. But being myself in their shoes, that's not empathy. I need to be them and I need to understand their challenges. And it's such an important thing. And as the themes of all day-to-day, -day, inclusion and diversity are key. And this is a big trend in technology now. With ethics, data privacy, algorithmic bias and accountability, having empathy to, if something went wrong, how would that affect people is a big thing because we have a huge responsibility in technology. A huge responsibility. This is our lives now. This is our futures. And with that comes a great deal of responsibility and empathy. So, top left-hand corner, um, does anybody know what's wrong with those images? Anybody know? Those two people don't exist. There's um, an AI-generated image. So if you want to go, it's called, uh, the website's thispersondoesn'texist.com, and it just randomly will show you images that a computer is making. And it's with that, obviously, it's a bit scary. Um, 
The thing on the right is algorithmic bias. So this was um, on Late Night with John Oliver. James Ravelli, he is a low risk of reoffending. So this is a software in America in penitentiaries, um, and it scores people on the likelihood of them reoffending, and they spotted that there was a glitch. Um, so James Ravelli has one domestic violent aggravated assault, one grand theft, one petty theft, one drug trafficking, and one grand theft, and he has a low risk score of three of reoffending. However, Robert Cannon has only one petty theft against him, and he's a medium risk of six to reoffend. Algorithmic bias is a terrifying thing when we're moving into a world where we're going into much more machine learning and much more artificial intelligence. And if diversity and inclusion isn't in that makeup, that is a scary place to be. So having empathy, having diversity and inclusion isn't a nice to have, and I cannot stress this enough. In data privacy with GDPR now, it's, again, from a leadership level, the accountability is with all of us. It's not just with a leader to make sure that these things and teams are inclusive. Focus on trust. And we talked about um, being heard. In technology, I am an extrovert surrounded in a room of introverts. And as a leader, I have to be very, very careful to this. Um, because it's really, really easy for introverts to be left out of a conversation. And as a leader, that really, really affects me, and that really bothers me, because I don't want that to happen. So this is a bit small, but these are some tips that I would give um, as an extrovert working with introverts. Give advance warning. Don't pe put people on the spot for an answer or an opinion. Introverts often need time to formulate their thoughts. Ensure you hear all the options in the room. Don't let extroverts dominate the conversation. Barack Obama used to have this really great technique that he would be in a meeting, and obviously the extroverts would take control of a, a meeting, and kind of he'd see who hadn't spoken. And before they would leave the room, Barack would go, right, you've not said anything. Your opinion is incredibly valid to me. So before we all go, I'd like to hear from the people who've not said anything. And if you don't want to talk now, that's cool. If you want to formulate your thoughts, we can catch up in the morning. Make sure in an industry where we are surrounded by introverts that everyone has a voice. Allow time alone. All of us need personal time, but introverts may require even more time to recharge, to energize. I mean, I'm not an introvert, but does anyone relate with that? Okay. Allow different communications methods. I'm going to contradict myself with this one later, uh, especially written communication. Um, allowing people to write their thoughts ahead of time if required. Um, and then the last one with the modern plan office, you know, be careful because chatter, music, pinging emails to an extrovert is the soundtrack of my life. I know and I'm quite comfortable with that. For an introvert, that can be constant disruption and overwhelm the senses, resulting in lost productivity or even stress. So be careful of that and be mindful of that. And don't think that your introverted team members are antisocial if they take themselves and the laptops off to a quiet corner. There's a really great book that I read on this called Quiet by Susan Cain. She also did a TED Talk, which is incredibly good to watch as well. Um, it's the power of introverts in a world that can't stop talking. Um, as an extrovert, I cannot tell you how much I could empathize a lot more with introverted people in my team to make sure that I could be a considerate leader and make sure my management team really thought about inclusivity um, at all levels. So don't forget about me. Um, so people will have seen these things, right? Power influence grids. So low uh, interest and power. So whenever I work on big projects at Sky still to this day, I'll do one of these things. So we work on big, big projects, and we have tons of stakeholders. And the problem is that a stakeholder that has been forgotten about is a dangerous stakeholder, because they can come in halfway through your, your uh, project and derail things. And rightfully so, if they are a stakeholder and they should have been involved in it, they're going to be a bit pissed, right? Um, so a power influence grid is really useful. Write down every member of your faculty, whoever is invested in, let's say, this IT project that you're working on, um, and then play a game of where they would sit. So low power, low interest, it could be somebody in finance, somebody who wants to know what's going on. Um, low interest, high power could be, I don't know, the dean, 
uh, depending on the structure, somebody who's got a lot of power, but not a huge amount of interest, they're, they're busy, but they want to know what's going on, to high interest, low power. I call these the chickens. They really want to be involved, so you have to manage them, because otherwise they'll just make a lot of noise and kind of peck away, and you don't really need that noise. So they have a lot of interest in your project. They find it fascinating, but they're actually not a key stakeholder in it. So as it says there, you keep them informed. You keep them at arm's bay by keeping them feeling like they're in the loop. They've got some skin in the game, even though they don't really have. And then top right-hand corner, high interest, high power. You manage them closely. They're your big stakeholders. And be mindful that projects are transient. They change. You know, requirements come, requirements go, and people on this will move about. So make sure that you're targeting these people correctly and make sure you know how they want to be communicated to. Don't fall into email lethargy. I, I really hate emails. I'm really conscious about how I communicate to people. So if I can do it, I'd like to do it face to face. But then equally, I'm aware of introverted potentially people in my team who might find that a bit overwhelming. So I might have a face to face discussion with them and then give them a, um, a night to kind of digest what we've talked about. And then we pick it up maybe in the morning. It might be over Slack, it might be over a telephone call, but don't fall into the trap that everything has to be over email. It's a real dangerous thing that we do in tech, and it, not a lot of people don't like it. We're a people industry. And so going back to the soft skills, nine times out of 10, the reason I can't promote people, people want to be promoted usually because of duration. I've been in this job for 10 years. I deserve a promotion. I have been really loyal to you. I deserve a promotion. And a lot of the time, I can't promote people not because they're not the cleverest person in the room, not because they don't have oodles of domain knowledge, experience, but because their soft skills or their human skills aren't where they need to be. I can't make them a people manager. They have no interest in public speaking. They have no interest in line management. They have no interest. Um, I'm trying to think, in, in taking ownership for a project. So I'll controversially say, a lack of focus on developing your human skills is absolutely hindering you from progressing further in your career. It's as simple as that. And you take that as a glass half full moment. These things are really easy to get training in. So getting experience in influencing and negotiation skills, stakeholder management, in public speaking, and, and using it in practice will, ha it will make things easier. But you have to develop them. And they you know, go back to the, the initial, initial statement. They're not a nice to have. And so we talked about this at the beginning. So my argument is that people leave bad managers. I can't, you know, I've been around the block a bit. That sounds a bit weird. But um, um, I don't think I've ever left a job because I didn't enjoy the company. I have left many jobs because of bad managers. One of the biggest decisions you will make is who you put in charge of people management. It's one of the biggest decisions I really weigh upon myself when I make that decision because it's a big decision. It's a big responsibility. You know, you have got to teach, to inspire, to motivate, to lead by example, to mentor, to make sure that that pipeline of future leadership talent is being mentored by these people. It isn't just as much as just to do PDPs. I take a huge amount of responsibility on people that I line manage, that I'm pushing them out of their comfort zone. I'm identifying opportunities for them that they haven't seen themselves because I have that... Uh, moment of abstract that I can take a step back and see the potential, see opportunities in them that they can't see in themselves. So when you make somebody a line manager, when you give people line responsibility, what training are you giving them? What support are you giving them to make sure that when they're looking after people that they're getting the best out of them? And as the number of you that put your hands up show, this matters. People leave and in an industry where there are more jobs than people, nobody has any hesitation to leave now. You know, I kind of joke with my team to say that if you are unhappy, you know, you could leave and earn five grand more at least somewhere else. That's the, the problem now. There is more jobs than people, so you have to create an incredibly inclusive, positive workplace that people want to stay at. 
So Google spent five years on this project called Project Aristotle, searching for the answer of what makes teams perform really well and other teams perform really poorly. And after searching, they decided that psychological safety is correlated positively with team success. So you might question what is psychological safety. It, for me, it's keeping me away from horror films. But um, it is defined as the belief that no one will be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. Now, that sounds obvious, right? Of course it does. How many of you have felt in that situation, though, that you have not been able to speak up? You've been terrified to speak up. And so the psychological danger, fear of admitting mistakes, blaming others, less likely to share different views, you create this common knowledge effect. And it holds companies back. So psychological safety is comfortably admitting mistakes. We fail fast. We learn from mistakes. We learn from failure. We're comfortable with that. We, we develop incrementally if you follow an agile uh, way of working. Every, everyone openly shares ideas and it becomes better innovation and decision making. And it is, and as leaders, as managers, you have the opportunity to create this culture. And it is, it, otherwise it is stifling. And so one of the things that we used to do at the BBC is I had a, a no blame culture and I still do. You've made a mistake, do you know what, let's find out about it, let's figure out what went wrong, and let's talk about it and let's learn from it. But it's not about blame, it's not about raising any names or throwing any cusses about, we'll, we'll all work together to fix it, but you've got to bake a cake. Now, it can't be a shop-bought cake. I had many developers try and go to booths and waitrose and rough a cake up in a bag to make it look like they'd built it and made them, baked it themselves. They'd be sent home and they had to make a cake. And I can tell you, I've eaten some truly atrocious cakes in my time. Um, but it's about keeping it positive and fun. And, you know, the cake was a, an apology of sorts. Um, it felt more, yeah, it definitely was an apology of sorts. But, um, but it is that safety is a key thing, that we will laugh about it afterwards. And as we've talked about, I have a nonlinear background. I used to be a music photographer. That's how I kind of started out. So I got to take photos of lots of bands. I became really good friends with Muse. Um, so that's a photo of a guitar that Matt Bellamy from Muse gave me once. Um, and my husband used to uh, hate this guitar because it was kind of smashed in half um, and told me to sell it. So I sold it for 500 pounds. And I used to joke and say, look, if it turns up on Antiques Roadshow, I'll kill you. Um, so it turned up on eBay. Um, so um, went into, I did a degree in film um, at Leeds. And as I talked about earlier, a lot of the conventions that I used in film are very similar to tech. Um, we would shoot in blocks, effectively call that a sprint. We would try and aim to get as many scenes done in a block. So call those stories if you work in an agile way. It rains, we've got to quickly think on our feet and think what we could get in the can um, to not waste a day. We would work as a team. We all had our clear roles and responsibilities. Um, I used, had budgeting, obviously communication, collaboration. Um, went to work for places like, um, on TV shows like Emmerdale. People skills, grit, working very long hours in television. Uh, stakeholder management, these are all incredibly transferable skills. And then I went to work for local government, um, getting businesses to network with academia to try and encourage more businesses to use the R&D facilities and universities to collaborate more, which is really, really hard because usually the university professors that the universities would send along would not be that into networking, would be pretty peeved that they were having to give up their evenings to uh, do this. But there'd be some incredible collaborations if I listened and match made people successfully. And so my non-linear background came in incredibly useful in tech. I took a leap of faith um, <laughs> oh, due to um, an unnamed Australian lager, um, I got into tech. So I used to enter competitions, um, and I won nine holidays, would you believe? Um, yeah, <laughs> you have to be in it to win it. And um, I won an £8,000 Qantas gift card. 
So I remember saying to Emmerdale, look, I want to take a bit of time off to go travelling. And they said, no. And I said, go on, I've, I've got to use it in three months. And they said, no. And I said, bye-bye. <laughs> and jetted off to Oz and came back. And I got a temp job working at Yorkshire Ford when I came back. And the rest is history. I then started looking after a load of the websites there um, and gained... I already knew how to code, to be fair. But I gained a lot of experience, obviously, delivering that client side and then took my first leap of faith working agency side in tech. So I did things like Dancing on Ice, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, Britain's next top model for broadcasters. Then got headhunted to the BBC. I was the first employee at BBC Sport Digital. So I did the rebrand of BBC Sport from their old website to the new website, the first rebrand in nine years. I did the London 2012 Olympics, the BBC Sport app. And then over to Sky, launching brand new Sky Q and, and launching a brand new mobile phone network with Sky Mobile. We launched it in less than two years, which is unheard of for a mobile phone network. So I cannot implore upon you with a non-linear background. You are hiring talented people, not a job description. Your job description is not going to do any work. Do not define people for great jobs. Look at defining jobs for great people. We have a shortage of skills and people like me with non-linear background skills where, to be fair, I, I had a coding background, but to teach me the software delivery life cycle, it was not too dissimilar to what I'd learned in film and TV. And so look outside of your net and look at the potential because there are tons of diamonds in the rough like me, um, and I've not done too bad. And then with my last five minutes or so, I wanted to also talk about my personal experiences. So I don't always believe in climbing up the ladder. For me, when you climb up the ladder, it's great. You get, obviously, probably more money, more responsibility. But in my experience, when you climb up the ladder, you step away from the thing that got you into the industry in the first place. Instead of being, you know, head deep into projects, I'm now looking at things in a much more strategic level. I'm probably in a lot more meetings, and I'm not actually on the ground doing things, which is what excited me in the first place. And that's cool. But I think that at a point, when you keep climbing up the ladder, you, you will have a lot more stress, potentially, a lot more responsibility, a lot more asked of you. And so I think it's OK to get off the ladder and sidestep and so for me, it's helped me with my growth mindset. So there's a, a lady called Carol Dweck, a professor in America, I think at Stanford, who came up with this feeling of the growth mindset and the fixed mindset. And the fixed mindset is things like, I'm either good at it or I'm not. I've tried it, I'm just not good at that. Failure is the limit of my abilities. I don't like to be challenged. I can either do it or I can't. Um, when I'm frustrated, I give up and feedback and criticism is really personal. And I had a really fixed mindset. I'm, you know, I'm proud of, to be good at stuff. So when I wasn't good at stuff, I'd, I'd kind of quickly close myself off from it. Whilst growth mindset is much more that a failure is an opportunity to grow. Challenges help me grow. I like to try new things, and I'm inspired by the success of others. And for me, moving towards a growth mindset was me doing that outside of work. I wasn't I found more challenges to do that. So, uh, like I talked about earlier, I'm on the industry steering board for the University Leeds School of Computing. I uh, got asked to be the festival director for the Leeds International Festival. I have never been a festival director before. I have never put events on at scale before. And I thought, hey, why not? Sounds cool. So I did an event where I microchipped five people in Leeds with a chip that they can program so they became cyborgs. I did an event trying to take away the sensationalism from sex robots. The problem was that people knew I was doing this event so for about six months any article about sex robots people were tagging me in on Facebook and my parents really had to talk to me to question if me and my husband were having some problems. Um, I created Leeds Digital. Um, that's how I know about all of the meetups. I saw there was a gap that nobody was really um, harnessing all of the meetups that were happening in the region and championing it. So I thought, well, surely I can't be the only one would find that useful. So I found out about all of the meetups. 
I put together a handout that I made myself, printed it myself, and sent it out to people, to universities, to companies, to encourage more people to go to them. <laughs> and through that, I kind of thought about role models. So everyone remembers Ali McBeal, right? And the dancing baby, which was a bit creepy. Um, <laughs> it really does look so creepy now. Um, but I have so many friends that became lawyers because of Ali McBeal. And it was really great. I was at an event recently where a friend of mine that I was at school with, it was an event in London, um, was like, she shouted and went, yeah, that was me as well. And suddenly we had this female role model that warts and all, you saw everything to do with law. And that inspired people to do that. Because you can't be what you can't see. And so... I really wanted to inspire more women to get into technology, like I had, because I love it. It's really creative. It's really people-orientated. I get to learn. I get to travel. I get to call, come to cool things like this. Yes, you're all really cool. Um, and I um, wanted to give people access to female role models. So um, looking at the trends, and this is 2016, over 90% of the people who sit at level computing in the UK are boys. That trend isn't going away, and it's really exasperating. But then if you look at the trend for something like expressive arts, it's overwhelmingly female. That females like creativity. Um, you know, Einstein said, you know, creativity is intelligence having fun. And I think that with computing and with IT, it sounds dry, it sounds boring. And that's why I really want to get the A into STEM to steam it. Um, to actually show that it is a creative industry. And so that's why I created Empowering Women with Tech. It's um, a movement that I created over two years ago now to educate, elevate, and empower more women into digital technology and science roles. And we do that through role model events, giving women access to tech so they can have a night of tinkering with tech. I do that in collaboration with companies but with universities as well so the University of Leeds were at our last uh, second, second to last event um, and then big national conferences as well where we get role models that you wouldn't expect to be techie somebody like Lauren Laverne who talked about setting up the pool which is um, a brilliant website which is very much missed um, or Susie Bubble who's a fashion blogger we also had people like Dr. Sue Black um, we had Professor Sophie Scott we had Dr. Suze Kundu who's a material scientist but to show role models in different career paths, not in the atypical ones, to show how broad the industry is so that we can inspire others to follow. And nearly all of them have nonlinear journeys like I do. And I'm going to end with one final point. So some of you might have seen my incredibly gorgeous baby who is with my mum who's pretty tired right now. Um, but be a fearless pioneer like the other two ladies before me said. Encourage more to follow. I did a talk with my daughter at Ladies of Code that I set up. This was at my event, actually, last week that I did whilst I was on maternity leave. I'm still on maternity leave. Um, and we need to normalise these things. It's a really poor state of affairs when women can't come to stuff because they have no access to childcare or whether they think it's going to be a taboo thing to bring a baby. I can tell you it's not. I got lots of QE stuff. I think most of the people on the stalls were hoping they could sell to her. Um, <laughs> she's got more cups than probably teeth right now. Um, but I think that you have to be the change that you want to see. So don't be afraid to be yourself and don't be afraid to kind of bend the rules because they're actually not rules um, to encourage more. So take a bit of a leap of faith. Um, and that's me. Thank you. Could you stay, please? Thank you ever so much. Uh, I'm just going to ask our speakers to come back on, on stage in case the, anybody wants a photo opportunity, and I'm sure you would all like to say thank you. Um, just whilst um, Sally and Alison are making their way back to the stage, one of the themes uh, that I took away from that that, that struck with, with all the speakers was, was this idea that it's okay to be human. We are all human. We've all got feelings. We've all got emotions. And we probably work in an industry where we try not to show them. I know I'm guilty um, a, a, a lot. So, you know, I was very struck by, by Sally's po points that, you know, everybody can contribute given the right environment, but we need to create that environment. 
And if, if it's okay to be vulnerable. If you're vulnerable, you can put your hand up and go, I don't feel comfortable. Um, Alison, you know, made, made that point. If you've got that feeling in your stomach, you should probably listen to it. It's telling you something. It's a, it's a human thing. And um, Natasha, that, it's brilliant. You know, human skills are not desirable. They are essential. We're all human. Act on it. Um, could you join me in thanking our three speakers, please? Thank you ever so much. From Leeds. I'm from Leeds. I know. <laughs> I feel like just chanting Yorkshire now. <laughs>